Today we'll kick off our second semester of Anatomy and Physiology with Chapter 16, the Endocrine System. The Endocrine System is an, uh, another overarching control system, much like what we studied at the end of last semester, the Nervous System, but think of it as kind of a slow motion version. If the Nervous System is lightning fast with action potentials um, propagating down axons, the Endocrine System takes time to release chemical signals and activate its targets. So what's a hormone? A hormone is a chemical signal or messenger that's released from an endocrine gland from some glandular tissue that enters the bloodstream and alters the function of a distant population of cells. So that's what endocrine glands do is secrete these messengers and they travel in the blood. Once the signal goes in the blood, we're talking about a hormone. The endocrine system has a pretty <clears throat> far-reaching effect on the body. Look at all these different um, systems and variables that are affected by or controlled by the endocrine system. Reproduction, fertility, development, growth of the body throughout the processes, uh, fluid volume and electrolytes on a daily basis. <clears throat> anyway, we'll come back to all. We'll have to find examples of all these things as we go through the chapter. Uh, so what are the endocrine glands that we're going to be talking about? The endocrine man here will illustrate for us some of those glands. In red are shown some endocrine glands. The pineal gland, part of the epithalamus, we talked about when we talked about um, chapter 12, and it's a, a, a gland that releases a hormone that has some effect on the day-night cycle, the sleep and wake cycle. Pituitary gland, a very important one, and we'll talk about that. We, talked, we, we, we re referred to it last semester, now we'll get right into it. The thyroid gland right here, the neck, spongy gland at the base of your neck. Uh, on the posterior of the thyroid gland are four little islands of parathyroid gland tissue. Completely separate gland, just has to be, just happens to be attached to the thyroid gland. The uh, adrenal glands, or nowadays they're often called the suprarenal glands, these two glands here on top of the kidneys. Uh, so those are the adrenal glands proper. <clears throat> the hypothalamus is a hugely important uh, over seer of the of much of the endocrine system the top of a hierarchy of, of command and um, it's considered a neuroendocrine gland because really uh, a bunch of nuclei of the hypothalamus has axons whose terminals release chemical signals into the blood and so in that regard the hypothalamus becomes an endocrine gland an endocrine function some organs have multiple uh, functions both endocrine and exocrine the pancreas is largely an exocrine gland that produces uh, digestive enzymes for your intestines, to place in your intestines to digest all the food you eat. But it also has some endocrine tissue sprinkled in there, as I'm sure you know, as the pancreas produces hormones like insulin and glucagon. Gonads produce the secondary, or the, the sex hormones, the testosterone and estrogen, for example, and progesterone. And the placenta, we won't really talk too much about the, 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 the reproductive aspects of endocrine function. And finally, we have some organs who just happen to have a small component uh, of endocrine tissue and release hormones. Adipose tissue releases some important hormones that affect uh, food intake and satiety. You know, much of the digestive process is controlled by hormones that are secreted by the, the, the digestive tract and, and, and affect its function. I will save most of that discussion for another chapter, chapter 23. Stomach releases a hormone. The heart this is an important hormone that helps control uh, blood volume. And the kidneys release a hormone that helps control red blood cells in the, in the blood. <clears throat> um, hormones, as we said, are chemical messengers that affect target tissues in the body. Distant tissues, what do we mean by target tissues? Tissues whose cells have specific receptors for a given hormone. Those are its target cells or target tissues. <clears throat> There's two classes, chemical classes of hormones. Steroids, which are uh, produced from cholesterol, which is a type of lipid. So these hormones are not appreciably water-soluble. Uh, they're produced uh, by the gonads and by the adrenal cortex, the outer part of the adrenal gland. Those are the sole two sources. All the rest of the hormones we'll be talking about, all the rest of the glands shown by the endocrine man, those are all what are called amino acid-based hormones. Strings of amino acids formed into peptides, and uh, then they have their function 
um, by circulating the blood, um, and they're very, very soluble. <clears throat> More about those chemical classes of hormones. Steroid hormones are carried by, by carrier proteins. They can't really dissolve in large amounts in the blood, so carrier proteins can uh, have little pockets where these hydrophobic uh, chemicals can bind and be circulating in the body readily. Um, they're actually also synth synth synthesized on demand. That means that we, when we stimulate uh, a, a, one of the gonads or the adrenal cortex, that's when hormone production begins. We have to wait for that, that endocrine gland to produce some hormone, release it into the blood. Um, it takes a while. It's a slow process. And once the hormones are produced, they tend to hang around for a long time. So we have slow onset and long duration. Amino acid-based hormones are typically stored, synthesized and stored. So if you look inside of an endocrine cell, you'll often see a whole bunch of vesicles, containers, membrane sacs filled with hormone ready to go so that when you stimulate those cells, they immediately excitose some hormone out and, it's, and it diffuses right into the blood until we have fast onset. And the hormones don't hang around long. Amino acid-based hormones, the minute we stop synthesizing or releasing it into the blood, it'll be degraded and removed and it'll be gone. So fast onset and short duration. <clears throat> what are some of the, the ways that hormones can make target cells respond? Well, we already know about one example because when we studied chapter 14, we saw that epinephrine and norepinephrine released from the adrenal medulla are activators of all the sympathetic nervous system target organs. And the way they work is by causing ion channels to open. We saw, that, we saw that they're indirect neurotransmitters, and we'll come back to that. Enzyme activation, again, we'll talk about um, how uh, hormones actually work, general mechanisms, and we'll see that some of them work by enzyme activation and secretion. What if it's an endocrine gland and some stimulus comes, an endocrine cell would then exocytose or secrete its product. Uh, so that's one another example. Proliferation. Sometimes when a hormone binds to its receptors in a particular tissue, then there's growth happening. Uh, cells are dividing. Mitosis is happening. For example, in the placenta, uh, in the presence of progesterone, the endometrium grows uh, precipitously, prodigiously, I should say, and produces a nice lining for a potentially a fertilized embryo. <clears throat> Gene expression. Again, when we talk about mechanisms of hormone function, we'll talk all about that example. So let's start, about, start out talking about the amino acid-based water-soluble hormones. How do they work? How do they activate their target cells? What's the mechanism? Mechanism means the physical way that things take place. Um, amino acid-based hormones bind to cell surface receptors. They cannot cross the cell membrane. They're large, charged molecules, and so they can't cross over there. They bind to receptors on the surface, and those receptors then activate some processes in the cell to produce another chemical within the cell called a second messenger that then carries on the, uh, the signaling cascade within the cell. So let's look at two second messenger signaling systems. Um, one we've already looked at, and let's review that. It's exactly the same as we saw it before when we talked about epinephrine and norepinephrine. And then we'll talk about another one, a new one, that we haven't uh, visited before. <clears throat> so if you remember, if epinephrine and norepinephrine bind to the receptors, incidentally, those are called the first messengers, they activate a G protein. This is a G protein coupled receptor. The G protein now that was hanging out there becomes activated, GTP binds, it's released from the receptor, and it can zoom around in the membrane until it bumps into an adenylate cyclase enzyme. So there's the enzyme activation thing happening. The enzyme is activated and produces cyclic AMP from ATP, and cyclic AMP is a very powerful second messenger in virtually all your cells. In this case, it happens to be activated by a hormone. And cyclic AMP will activate a kinase. You see the word kinase associated with an enzyme. It means it's an enzyme that puts a phosphate group onto another protein, tears it off of an ATP, and attaches it on a protein, activating that protein. And a whole domino effect, a whole cascade of these changes is going to happen in the cell by way of kinase activity of enzyme after enzyme, which will eventually lead to some change in the, in the cell function. Here's another uh, mechanism of, of second messenger signaling. In this case, when the, when the hormone binds to its receptor, it's going to activate a G protein. 
Uh, this is drawn a little bit differently from the previous um, uh, rendering we just saw because a different artist drew it a slightly different way it looks, but it's the same exact thing. The G protein is activated as GTP binds. <clears throat> it's released from the receptor. In this case, it strikes not an adenylate cyclase, but an enzyme called phospholipase C. And phospholipase C has specificity for one of a number of different phospholipids that happen to be in the membrane of your cells. All cells have a number of different, of the, these little gray balls represent a polar chemical group attached to uh, these long chain fatty acids. And uh, one particular one, phosphatidyl inositol phosphate, um, is going to be attacked by this enzyme and it will actually cut its head off. One of these little gray balls, they drew it as a big orange thing, but they're just trying to help you see what it is. It's just one of these gray balls is going to be cut off and it will release inositol triphosphate. And inositol triphosphate is a powerful signaling agent. It causes an increase in intracellular calcium. You can see calcium now being released from the, in, the, the endoplasmic reticulum. Usually also a membrane receptor will be activated by IP3 to, to allow calcium to enter from the outside the, from outside the cell. And calcium is a powerful signaling agent in any cell. Normally cells have no calcium in the cytoplasm at rest. Now we've got calcium. It's going to activate a, a calcium-dependent um, protein called a calmodulin. Calmodulins are a family of proteins that when they bind calcium, then they have their activity. And so now we have an active calmodulin which can turn on some, some cellular processes. Um, it just so happens that in this case, there's a two-pronged attack because when we cut the head off of this, uh, this phospholipid, the remaining part called diacylglycerol is a powerful signal which turns on protein kinase C. There's that kinase thing happening again. That means this is going to phosphorylate another protein. It becomes active and it goes around phosphorylating signaling proteins, which ultimately will again will lead to a, a change in cell function. So we have two pathways uh, being activated that, that activate different things within the cell. And uh, so we have a very powerful um, signaling method mechanism. Okay, that's our story with respect to water-soluble hormones, amino acid-based hormones. Steroid hormones work by binding to intracellular receptors. We said that they're lipid, not very water-soluble. The carrier protein has now delivered this hormone to the cell. It can cross freely over the membrane because it's lipid. It can go right through that lipid bilayer. And it binds to an intracellular receptor. Here we see it attached on. Now that, that the receptor is activated, it goes into the nucleus and it activates gene expression. Here we can see it binding to a specific location in a chromosome, which is going to turn on transcription of that gene. That means producing messenger RNA. We had a recipe in here essentially for making protein, and we copied it out in the form of messenger RNA. That goes into the cytoplasm, and we're going to produce a brand new protein by translation. So the activated receptors for steroid hormones are called transcription factors because they turn on transcription of genes changes in gene expression and new proteins that are produced. So that's how steroid hormones work. <clears throat> Let's talk about distribution of target cells and the term specificity. It might be a little unfortunate uh, choice of words, but that's just what endocrinologists call this, this concept. A specific hormone might be exemplified by adrenocorticotropic hormone. That's a mouthful. That's a hormone that we'll talk more about, but it only has a small population of target cells in the adrenal cortex, the adrenal gland. It's the only place that it works. It's called specific because it has that very narrow range of, of target uh, tissue. Thyroid hormone works on almost all the cells in your body. And because it's so, its target cells are so broadly distributed, it's called a nonspecific hormone. The reason I say that's kind of unfortunate is that when a hormone binds to its receptor, that binding is a specific process. That receptor binds only to one hormone. That's a type of specificity. Now we're using the word to mean something else. Uh, how broadly distributed are the target cells for a particular hormone? <clears throat> the next topic I'd like to tackle is, what is it that determines how active the target cells are going to be? Wherever they may be, are they going to be turned on a little bit? some small cell changes, or are they going to really be maxed out and cause some, do some real backflips? So what are the factors affecting how active the, um, the, the, the target cells are going to be?
It has to do with how many receptors are going to be activated at a given, at a given moment on the cells. Three things affect that. Three things affect the number of activated receptors. One is the affinity of binding. Because when hormones bind to the receptors, it's, not, it's a reversible process. That once the receptor and hormone are connected, the, hor the receptor is activated, but then the hormone may fall off. And then it may bind again and fall off, so it's a reversible process. And the higher the affinity, the longer that hormone is going to stay bound and activate that receptor and so forth. So uh, affinity, we'll talk more about that. Relative number of receptors per cell. If every receptor activates a G protein, which then activates a, an enzyme of some kind, for example, the more receptors there are, the more G proteins will be activated, and the more signaling we'll get in the cell, and the more change we'll see. So some cells have a, may have a lot of receptors for a hormone, some not so many, uh, so that determines kind of how responsive the cell will be. And finally, most importantly, the blood hormone levels. That's how we actually regulate hormone responses, by changing the concentration of hormone in the blood. So that's why I drew that one in red. That's the regulated variable. Uh, that's how we control hormones for the most part. So next time, we'll go through each one of those three examples of, of variables or factors that affect the degree of cell response to a hormone. So join me next time for that discussion, and we'll move on from there.